Good evening, everyone. I'm Paul Hoffman, the CEO of Liberty Science Center. This was a glorious day, a glorious floor, fall day. If you got outside at all, you saw that. The moon is out right now looking beautiful. But we're going to top off this glorious fall day with some insight into the night sky. And we can do that in this planetarium, the largest planetarium in the Western Hemisphere because we don't have any light pollution tonight and other things that interfere. So we have a wonderful guest who's going to present some of her work and give us some insights. The talk is called, Too Small to be a Star, Too Large to be a Planet, What's Up with Brown Dwarfs? And I'm very pleased that this evening we have Dr. Emily Rice, who is an astronomy professor at the Macaulay Honors College at uh, the City University of New York. She came across the river to join us. Um, she has a lot of interesting things in the field of astronomy. She has a store, an astronomy-based fashion store called the Startorialist that you should check out. And, you know, we do these astronomy space talks on the first Thursday of every month. We've done 10 of them now. We're going to take a break in November, but we start up again on December 1st with Sarah Seeger from MIT, who's one of the leaders and pioneers in finding exoplanets, planets beyond the solar system, so please come back. We're going to have a great evening, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Rice. Please, no pictures during this, and it's good to, you know, uh, put your cell phones in your pocket because the light from it will interfere with the images on the screen. And when we're done, we're going to exit from the top or if you have to leave in the, in the middle of this. Dr. Rice? Hi. <laughs> I am so thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for that introduction. I did come um, across the river, onto the river. I guess this is actually my first time in this planetarium. I'm very, very excited. Um, I do occasionally give presentations at the Hayden Planetarium acro uh, across the river, but I've heard there's no rivalry at all between, this one's the largest, this one's the largest, settled, that's all there is to care about. Um, I am going to uh, talk to you about my astronomical objects called brown dwarfs. Can I ask you really quick, is anybody here on a date? Hands, any hands? A few hands, okay. My goal tonight is to make you fall in love. Not, not with the person that you're with, but with, with the brown dwarfs. I want to make you fall in love with these astronomical objects that you've probably never heard about before tonight. Now, I can only barely see hands anymore. Has anybody ever heard of astronomical objects called brown dwarfs before? Oh, oh OK. Maybe I don't need to actually explain anything. I will anyway. Um, they are my objects of research. Um, and, but they get kind of a bad rap because one of the ways that, really the, the way that we understand brown dwarfs is to understand what they're not, which is stars. And sometimes they're even called failed stars, and I'll explain why. But really they're wonderful objects that we've only recently discovered um, out there in the galaxy, and they're very, very useful for understanding really our origins and the, the space that we live in, no pun intended. Um, and so what we're going to start with tonight is our familiar night sky, hopefully, with no light pollution. Is it maybe the spotlight can go down or something a little bit? There we go. Our beautiful, non-light polluted night sky. Does anybody recognize any of the stars that we see so far? We started with something familiar and something re relatively reasonable for what we should see this time of year in this latitude. Yeah, Orion, we see, especially the belt of Orion is very distinguishable. Here's the belt of Orion and then the sword underneath Orion. We'll look a little bit more at that later on. Um, but one of the things that I love about Orion and even one of the things, this, is, this almost makes me a bad astronomer to admit this, but I don't mind living in the city and not being able to see a gorgeous night sky. And the reason why is because any time that I look at the sky and see a bright object, I can almost always name it <laughs> because there's just not that many things out there that we can see. Um, if it twinkles, it's a star generally. If it doesn't twinkle, then you can tell that it's a planet. 
Um, and if you have an app on your phone that you can point towards the sky, that's a great way to do it as well. I, I even do that myself sometimes if I don't remember where the planets are. Um, and you might even know, so in Orion, the belt goes through the middle, and the bigger constellation is this nice kind of easy rectangle where the corners of the rectangle are these pretty bright stars. And you might actually even know the names of these stars. This one might explode on us. It hasn't yet. This one's Betelgeuse. The opposite corner is Rigel. And the belt is actually very useful for identifying a couple other stars that you might not be entirely familiar with. But in this direction, the belt points towards Sirius, which is actually the brightest star in the nighttime sky. And then in the other direction, the belt points towards Arcturus, which is a nice bright star in the constellation of Taurus, the bull. Um, Sirius is in the constellation of Canis Major, or the big dog. And so even just by, by remembering Orion's belt, you can find a bunch of bright stars. And you might even be able to notice that some of these stars have different colors. Actually, all of the stars in the night sky have different colors, but our eyes really only distinguish the colors for the very, very brightest ones. And so in the, here in the planetarium and even in the night sky, you can kind of tell Betelgeuse is kind of orangey red, Arcturus is orangey red, um, Capella is another nearby star. If you go higher in the sky, Capella is a yellowy kind of sun-like star, white, yellow, and then Sirius and Rigel are kind of bluey white um, in the nighttime sky. But maybe you've, you, maybe you've even noticed this if you took a, a really good look at the stars in the nighttime sky and notice these colors. But why do they have these different colors? It turns out it's physics. The colors of the stars indicate their temperatures. And the, the, um, the coolest stars are red stars. The middle stars, like the sun, are yellow stars. And the blue-white stars are actually these enormous, super hot stars. So a star like the sun is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The cool red star is about 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And the brightest stars, the blue-white stars, can be 80,000, even 100,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The colors of the stars is directly correlated with their temperatures. Um, but I'm lying to you a little bit. I'm not giving you the full truth. Because those red stars that I pointed out, Betelgeuse um, and Arcturus, they're not these small, red, cool, dim stars. They're actually giant, super giant, cool stars. So Betelgeuse is actually even larger than some of the blue-white um, blue stars that are in the nighttime sky. And that's because there's a, a difference between stars that are kind of regular stars that are fusing hydrogen into helium and stars like Betelgeuse that have become super giants at the end of their lifetime. I won't go too much more into that aspect of stellar evolution. Um, what I want to point out, because in order to understand the brown dwarfs, we really need to think about these cool red stars that we don't actually see. So the stars that we see in the nighttime sky are the ones that are either these big, enormous ones, or these big, hot ones, or nearby, or a combination of both. But in the nighttime sky, there's actually a lot more of these small, faint, dim red ones and we just can't see them with the naked eye. They're too faint, they're too small, they're too, too dim, they're too cool, except that that's what the planetarium is for. So here is a lot of these nearby red, cool, dim stars just made a lot brighter so that we can see them. They really are all over the place, even more outnumbering the stars that we can see in the nighttime sky. Um, and you might wonder how we figured this out about the stars. How do, we, how do we figure out the properties of these distant things that we, we can't go to, we can't touch, we can't replicate in a laboratory? And the way that we do this is through the magic of rainbows. <laughs> really. So what we're going to do, we're going to zoom into a star field and what astronomers started doing in the late 1800s or so, um, after William Herschel discovered that you could do this, is to take light and spread it out into a spectrum. And when you take light and basically make a rainbow from any of these stars, you see dark lines in the spectrum of these stars. 
And additionally, your rainbows are going to be different brightnesses and different colors of light. So some of the rainbows from the stars will be brighter at blue. Some of the rainbows from the stars will be brighter at red. Some of the rainbows will be brighter across the entire spectrum. Um, and these dark lines actually correspond to the fingerprints of atoms and molecules that are in those stars, the same atoms and molecules that we can study in a laboratory here on Earth. And so even though we're not exactly replicating the conditions of a star, we can put our laboratory physics together with the observations of the stars and understand them using these spectra. And this was something that astronomers started to do in the early 1900s. And it was actually done by computers, even in the 1920s. It wasn't computers like we have now, not like our phones in our pockets. Back then, the computers were people. And in fact, they were women who did a lot of the tedious science of measuring these spectra, cataloging these spectra, classifying these spectra. And here is one of these so-called computers. Um, specifically computers that worked at the Harvard College Observatory, which was the, the leading observatory and the leading laboratory for studying astronomy in the early 1900s. This is Annie Jump Cannon, who single-handedly classified hundreds of thousands of spectra of stars that were collected by the Harvard College observatories um, over decades, really. And it was her single-handed classification of these stars that helped us figure out how the properties in their spectra corresponded to the physical properties of the stars themselves. Things like temperature and mass and their composition. Um, and one of the huge things that Annie did was figure out this spectral classification system. So people before her were assigning letters to different types of spectra of stars that corresponded to how bright the hydrogen lines, or how, how dark, I should say, how, how strong the hydrogen lines were in the spectrum of these stars. She started to realize that actually, in order to classify these stars by temperature, we have to rearrange the letters. And so the, the classification that she came up with is OBAFGKM, or as I like to call it, the astronomer's messed up alphabet. Um, where the O and the B stars are the hottest stars, the most massive stars, they're also very short-lived. A star like the sun is a G-type star. And then the red stars, the dim, cool, faint stars that we saw all over the dome are the M-type stars. Um, but, but all this stuff about stars, what about the brown dwarfs? So to understand the brown dwarfs in the scheme of all these stars, we have to understand what a star is, because that's exactly what a brown dwarf is not. And so what we're going to do is zoom into the Orion Nebula, which is this little fuzzy, not quite a star, in the belt under Orion, where stars are forming. So stars form from collapsing clouds of gas and dust. And this gas and dust is everywhere. It's all over the, space, the place between the stars and the galaxy. Sometimes it gets disturbed, maybe by um, nearby stars or nearby supernovae, and it starts to collapse. And if it's spinning at least a little bit when it starts, it'll start to spin faster as it collapses. It'll heat up towards the center. The very, very center will become a star. The material around the star will flatten out and continue spinning. You might get planets forming in that disk around that star. And eventually, the star will, will turn on and become a star. So here's that star. Here's a, a planet forming in the disk around the star, also kind of coalescing from the gas and dust around the star. But what makes the star a star is that there is enough mass collapsing at the center to ignite hydrogen fusion at the core of the star. So stars are mostly balls of hydrogen, um, as well as some helium and some heavier elements. And at the very, very core, it's a high enough temperature, a high enough pressure that protons whizzing around will kind of effectively stick to one another and start a chain reaction that changes four protons to a helium nucleus. So instead of just a um, hydrogen atom of just a proton, you'll end up with a helium atom of two protons, two neutrons, and a little bit less mass than you started with. And so according to the equation E equals mc squared, that famous one that everybody knows, this is actually a place where it applies, which is wonderful to know, you get a tiny little bit of energy release. But this reaction goes on billions of times per second. 
in the core of a star, releasing a huge amount of energy. And that energy pushes outwards from the core of the star and balances the enormous crush of gravity from the outer layers. So, so once the star turns on and starts this fusion, then it's going to be stable. It's going to be creating its own energy. It's going to start what we call its, its main sequence or its hydrogen burning lifetime, and it's going to shine like a star does. Um, a brown dwarf starts out effectively the same way, a collapsing cloud of gas and dust as well. But it doesn't have as much mass to begin with, we think. So the idea for a brown dwarf is that you start out with just a smaller cloud of gas and dust. It, it collapses, it forms a disk as well, but you don't have enough mass at the core to create a high enough temperature and pressure to ignite that stable hydrogen fusion. Um, I, I sometimes use the analogy that it's kind of like a car turning over, a, a, a gas-powered car turning over. I realize that my analogy is going to be outdated eventually. It's the, the engine turns over when you turn the key, but it never quite catches, and the engine never quite turns on. So brown dwarfs can form and fuse some things that are a little bit easier to fuse than hydrogen, lithium, deuterium, um, but they won't ever stably fuse hydrogen into their, in their cores, so they won't ever create their own energy like a star does. They just kind of cool and fade with time. And so you can see they become kind of dark and stripy, um, and they're, they're out there in space. Or this is the idea that astronomers thought of at first. And in fact, one astronomer um, named Shiv Kumar in the 1960s first described these low mass products of star formation. He worked out the equations for what this star would be like. What would its structure be like? What would its evolution be like? What would its size be like? What kind of mass is needed to form this brown dwarf? Um, and so he predicted basically a new class of objects in the early 1960s. He originally called them black dwarfs, thinking that they would eventually cool to nothingness, um, and was maybe piggybacking on the, the popularity of black holes at the time. Um, but another astronomer came along in the 1970s and coined the term brown dwarfs because they do kind of glow a little bit. They, they have some residual heat left over from their formation, and so they do actually release energy and cool and fade very, very slowly so that they are usually shining a little bit, but or radiating a little bit, I should say, but not steadily com, com, um, creating their own energy. They're just kind of cooling off. So they were predicted to exist in the 1960s, given their names um, in the 1970s, and then it took a while to actually find one. It wasn't until the 1990s, really, when we started to do all-sky surveys in infrared wavelengths of light that we found brown dwarfs. And so we have a beautiful view of the night sky, and this time I want to point out the Milky Way going high overhead. Um, even from the city, we, we won't be able to see the Milky Way until you go into a really dark location. And even then, you'll probably look at it and be like, what's that cloud? Like, why isn't it moving? It takes a little while to find the Milky Way. It's almost a shame that we're kind of losing this view, um, but it is there. But I, what I want you to notice about the Milky Way right now is that it's kind of patchy. It's actually bright in some places, but really dark in other places. And some cultures actually define the Milky Way by the dark patches and not the bright patches. But this is the visible light view that we have of the sky. Infrared light is longer wavelengths than our eye can see, which corresponds to lower energy and kind of cooler temperatures than a typical star. And so if we look at the night sky with infrared eyes, I want to show you what the Milky Way looks like. And it really does glow like that. And so the infrared survey of the sky is going to turn up potentially these brown dwarfs. Because they're so cool, they're not creating a lot of visible light radiation like the stars do. They're mainly predicted to um, emit radiation at these longer wavelengths of light. And so infrared observations of the sky really begin in earnest in the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, but still, not a lot of brown dwarfs were turning up, and, and nothing that was really bona fide um, too small to be a star and cool, too cool to actually fuse hydrogen into helium. And so what some astronomers started to do is instead of looking through a haystack for needles, they used needles that we already knew about and started to look around those needles. 
thinking that maybe the, the needles would be together. That, that analogy maybe doesn't quite work. But one thing that um, one astronomer in particular named Rebecca Oppenheimer, who was a graduate student at Caltech at the time and is now a curator at the American Museum of Natural History, um, started to do for her thesis project as a graduate student was look around nearby stars. And in fact, looking near some of the cool, faint red stars that I showed you at the beginning to see if there was anything cooler and fainter near those things. And so one star in particular that they looked at um, even very early on in the campaign is this nearby red star called Gliese 229b. So we're going to fly to Gliese 229, or sorry, Gliese 229, I'm giving it away. Gliese 229, and in fact, when they looked around this star, they saw an even fainter companion. And the colors of that star, so the brightness of that star at different wavelengths, indicated that it should be very, very cool. And in fact, around a year later when they got a spectrum of that star in the infrared, that spectrum showed methane absorption, which we really only seen from the spectrum of Jupiter. And so this companion had to be so cool that it had methane in its atmosphere, and it definitely had to be low mass enough to be a brown dwarf. And so Gliese 229b in 1995 was really the first bona fide brown dwarf to ever be discovered. And this was super exciting because it was done by a graduate student. There was teams of astronomers um, at Caltech and at Johns Hopkins that contributed as well. Eventually it was followed up with the Hubble Space Telescope. And it was announced um, at an international conference on cool stars and stellar systems in 1995 in Florence, Italy. And it was a watershed moment of announcing the first type um, of a new class of astronomical object for the first time since the 1960s when pulsars were discovered and that won a Nobel Prize. And so everybody knows it's, it was a banner day in astronomy discoveries when brown, dwarf, when brown dwarfs were discovered and they're now household names. Almost, not quite. Because what happened at that same conference um, is that exoplanets were announced the exact same time, the exact same conference. The Swiss team of Michel Mayor and Didier Quillot that ended up winning the Nobel Prize for discovering the first planets around sun-like stars announced it at the same conference where the first confirmed brown dwarf was announced. And I just, I still haven't gotten over that. I, I think it's just, it's, oh my goodness. If we only had even just a few years of brown dwarfs before we had exoplanets, imagine what that would have done for our PR. Um, but we still, we found it. So, so once that kind of, once the first confirmed brown dwarf kind of cracked the case open, we knew where to look for them and what to look for in our all sky surveys. And so we started finding a bunch more. Um, and since then, about 2,000 brown dwarfs have now been confirmed. And in fact, even some earlier discoveries before 1995 are now thought to be brown dwarfs, but they, they weren't the cool one that was the, a slam dunk, really. Um, and there's so many different types of brown dwarfs, and they're so different from stars, that they actually warranted three entirely new spectral types. And so now the sequence continues on later through the alphabet. M, L, T, and Y are new spectral classes of objects that describe the coolest, faintest, lowest mass star-like things out there in space. Um, but the exoplanets still always win. <laughs> so there's almost 2,000 brown dwarfs that have been discovered really all over the sky. But for exoplanets, there's now over 5,000 exoplanets known. Um, a lot of them concentrated here in this one part of the sky where the Kepler mission stared for several years. This is a NASA um, telescope that was um, focused on finding planets around other stars. Um, but I do want to point out that these exoplanets, the, the vast majority of these exoplanet discoveries are indirect detections. We know about these planets because of m measurements that we've, that we've made of light from the stars. And we don't actually know too much about the planets themselves. We're very limited to the information that we can get about the planets themselves, which is not the case for the brown dwarfs. So that first brown dwarf, Gliese 229b, was found as a companion to another star. But once we started to know what to look for, we found all of these 2,000 brown dwarfs, most of which are free-floating objects. And so they don't have a nearby star 
to kind of block out our light or hamper our observations of those brown dwarfs. It also turns out that a lot of these exoplanets are even more massive than the biggest planets in our solar system. So Jupiter is the biggest planet in our solar system, and until we started to find planets around other stars, we didn't necessarily know how big planets could get. And it turns out that exoplanets can be 5, 10, 20 times, maybe even 30 times the mass of Jupiter around another star. We don't really have a way to figure out what that would be like, except for the brown dwarfs. And the brown dwarfs are out there on their own with about the same masses. Um, the upper limit for a brown dwarf that would actually be a star, so the lowest mass a star can be, is about 80 times the mass of Jupiter. And less than that, a star is not going to fuse hydrogen, uh, it's going to be a brown dwarf. And so the, the 30 or 40 times the mass of Jupiter as an exoplanet is essentially a brown dwarf. Like, they're very similar objects to study. They just form in different ways. Um, another way that the brown dwarfs beat the exoplanets, not that it's a competition, but it is a little bit for grant money and observing time and things like that, um, and another way that the brown dwarfs are even more exciting than exoplanets is that we already know where the closest exoplanets are. So if we fly out of the solar system, we're going to start from Earth and fly out of the solar system, because this is a fun thing to do in any planetarium, away from home. The moon is going by, we're leaving the solar system, going through eventually the Oort cloud. This is where comets come from we think, yeah, lots of comets out there and lots of space to cover. We're going to go kind of stop just outside our solar system about four light years away. That's that sphere is about four light years away from Earth, away from the sun. And that's where the closest stars are. So the Alpha Centauri A and B system, Proxima Centauri is actually the closest star system, or the closest star in that system. It's a faint red object that we can't see with our naked eye. Um, it's about four light years away. We know that there are some exoplanets in that system. Um, and Wolf 359 and Barnard Star are some other nearby red low mass stars. But, and those have been known for hundreds of years. But what we didn't know about are these other two objects, WISE 1049 and WISE 0855. They have these kind of license plate names because they come from a survey and they were only recently discovered less than 10 years ago. So these brown dwarfs, they're very, very cool objects, very, very faint, very, very dim, very difficult to find unless you're looking very carefully in infrared light. We did not know that they existed even right in our backyard. Um, and, and we're still looking for potentially even closer brown dwarfs. And you can actually help because one of the things about looking for these objects is that they could be anywhere in space, anywhere on the sky. And so what astronomers are doing is still kind of combing through infrared all-sky data. And there is a wonderful community science project that co that's called Backyard Worlds that's funded by NASA. It uses all-sky um, images. And what you do is you look for very faint objects that are moving through the images. And so what you do is you get a postcard, a postage stamp of observations like this. And before it moves, I want you to look at it and see if you can guess where a brown dwarf might be in here. There's a bunch of random little speckles, but this, this is astrophysics, folks. Like, this is modern astrophysics. <laughs> super, super glamorous. But what you actually do for this project is you look at a comparison of images. So the images will blink back and forth, and that is going to make the brown dwarf easier to see. Because the brown dwarf in, in images that were taken at two different times, the brown dwarf is going to move. And so now that the image is moving, you can see that most of the speckles basically stay where they are, but this one is actually moving a little bit across the image. And that one, it turns out, is one of these new brown dwarfs. But there's lots more of this data to comb through, and humans are much better at catching these things than computers are. And so that's why NASA has put all of the data available on a website called backward, backyardworlds.org. The website will train you how to look at these things, you, you can flag things that you think might be brown dwarfs, and the astronomers will go look at them with telescopes and potentially find even more nearby brown dwarfs that could be closer than the closest stars that we already know about. 
and so we can fly out and see our wonderful brown dwarf friends and our exoplanet friends. And so now I hope you've fallen in love with these things that maybe they're failed stars, but who said they wanted to be stars anyway? Maybe they're very successful exoplanet analogs. Maybe they're exactly what they wanted to be. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So we're gonna questions. When you exit at the top and go back down to where the entrance to the planetarium, you saw the glass in the area with the beautiful hanging sphere. Dr. Rice will be there to answer any questions. But I have a few for you first. Sure, sure. Tell me about your <laughs> dress. <laughs> I did dress for the occasion, so I do have um, an online shop that started as a blog about astronomy and fashion, and part of the reason why was from doing planetarium shows like this and wanting to dress appropriately. And this one in particular is my very special brown dwarf dress. It's a real astronomical image. It's an image of Jupiter taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, but what I did is I asked the dressmaker, um, her name is Holly Renee, and she has a company that's called SheNova, and she makes wonderful science-themed dresses, and I said, color it purple so that it can be my brown dwarf dress, because we really do use Jupiter to understand the brown dwarfs, and so this is my brown dwarf dress. T-shirts on your site? <laughs> I do have T-shirts, right, yes. I'm going there right after <laughs> this. So what was it that first turned you on to astronomy? Do you remember? That's a very good question. Um, uh, it, it was the application of the physics and the math that I, I will admit that I was a nerd fr from day one. Like I was always very into math and very into e even physics. Um, but when I learned about the night sky and I learned about stars, I didn't have like a, a, a telescope moment where I was wowed or anything like that. I started to learn about them from the math side and learning that like, you know, that math can explain the orbit of the moon and why the moon is moving further away. And math can explain how stars change with time and how stars move through space and things like that. Um, and I just got hooked and I wanted to learn more and more and more and I never got bored <laughs> is the amazing thing. There's so many more, you know, I'm, I'm studying astronomical objects that weren't even discovered 30 years ago. Like, you know, when I was in high school, these things weren't known to exist yet. And, and there's new things being discovered today that people are going to be studying for decades from now. It's a very exciting field to be in. And it's cool when you talked about the new different kinds of objects in the cosmological zoo, pulsars, yeah. brown dwarfs. W do you expect that the Webb telescope soon is going to find a new kind of object? Yes, I hope so. I, I think that JWST is really, really exciting. So the James Webb Space Telescope has just recently launched less than a year ago. The images are amazing. I also have those images on clothing. <laughs> The images are amazing, the data is amazing, the telescope is performing even better than we had hoped. Um, and that's one of the amazing things about these NASA missions is that they, they take so long to plan and to launch and to commission and things like that, that by the time they're up there and by the time they're doing science and by the time we figure out how to use them best, the science has progressed so much that they're gonna start to do things that they weren't designed to do at all. And so JWST is, is already starting to find some of the most distant galaxies and starting to uh, observe exoplanets and look at their atmospheres and things like that. But I, I do think there will be something, I don't know what it'll be. Maybe it'll be the first generations of stars, maybe it'll be dark galaxies or something like that. But there's just every image of, from JWST that you look at, there's an enormous wealth of data there. That's fantastic. So let's give it up once more for Dr. Rice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Please come out and have a cosmic cocktail or ask her a question. Come back on December 1st for our next space talk. It will be about exoplanets. Not as cool as brown dwarfs, but <laughs> Don't tell pretty Sarah cool that. nonetheless. Thank Sarah you. Sarah Seeger is amazing. Definitely come back for her talk in December.